Hello and welcome. My name is Logan and I am currently an international teacher living in Germany. I have done this international thing for a few years and I thought it was high time that I go ahead and share my advice and I remember when I started out in this process and I had almost no one to rely on and no resources besides those that are sort of associated with the hiring companies and I thought it would be a good idea to share a teacher's insight and advice. Now, I hope to cover a few of these things in sort of a series of videos and keep it as condensed as possible while noting that I am an English teacher, so we do like to talk our heads off. If you would like to skip through sections, I have tried to link timestamps below, and I will probably put the chapter titles also there so you can follow those links once I create these videos to kind of cover these different topics. I think the easiest place to start is by defining what an international school is. And this can be quite difficult and a little bit vague and nebulous because international schools are everywhere, including the UK, the United States, and Australia. An international school is primarily defined by its intent or mission statement and outcomes for its students. Most international schools focus on some sort of international mindedness with some sort of global representation. This normally means that the curriculum aims to be diverse and that their school's students obtain some sort of background that con considers multiple cultures and perspectives. In general, I think that this comes down to sort of six things. First of all, an international school typically has a diverse student body, although this is not always the case. Sometimes you will be in a country where the school has um, primarily students from the host country, but in general, international schools have a wide range of students from around the world. Two, normally there's a diverse teaching staff, although I think this tends to be teachers from the UK and the US and Australia and New Zealand. I do not see as many uh, international teachers coming from other countries, although they do exist, it's just um, not as often. There's also a pretty big problem with international schools hiring non-white teachers. So I think this is a future consideration for schools around the world. And already I see that some schools are considering these issues. Although, of course, it needs to be more well thought out and considered in future hiring. So yeah, diverse teaching staff and diverse in quotation marks there. And I think that they're typically... Um, in international schools, students learn more than one language. This could be the host country language and then English, or it could be host country language, English, and then some other language on top of that. I've had students come out with five languages uh, or, or just two, but normally they have two. This also means that some of the curriculum is um, often taught in the second language, which is really interesting because it could be like uh, Bulgarian teaching sciences or history, or um, now in like Germany teaching like language and literature. The curriculum doesn't always have to follow uh, the host country's curriculum. Most of these international schools today follow an official international curriculum, the most famous being the International Baccalaureate, but there's also the Cambridge Assessment uh, International Curriculum. If uh, they do not use sort of the host country curriculum or one of these more official international curriculums, there is a tendency to use a Western curriculum, specifically uh, English-speaking curriculums. So, for example, I worked at a school that taught more like on an American United States basis, but there's also, I've heard of schools using sort of a UK curriculum with A-levels and that sort of thing. Just a little bit of a disclaimer here. Every international school is different, and every teacher who's moving abroad is different as well. So the following information is sort of what I'm saying to you. Take it with a grain of salt. There's no really rating system. It's very difficult to sort of select which schools are the best, uh, partly because it depends on like the results of the school. It also depends on the student body and the teachers that are sort of moving. You might want to go and be really in a situation where you get lots of cultural shock. <laughs> you might choose like a school that's very, very different from the one that you have been teaching at previously. Take everything I say with a grain of salt as I move forward. Let's start with sort of looking at um, the tier of schools. Every individual 
who goes abroad is going to want something different. Every school also has its flaws. There is no such thing as a perfect school. There's no such thing as a perfect administrator. There are always going to be issues no matter where you go. But there is kind of a consensus around which schools are the best in general. And this is based on a series of things. I will post a kind of a master list of which schools are considered like tier one or uh, exceptional schools. And this is based purely on kind of two things, what you get as a teacher in your package and what the school has as a whole in terms of its package. The master list sort of considers um, whether the school is a nonprofit versus a, a for-profit. There's a tendency for nonprofit schools to be much better, much nicer. That's kind of the same, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's a trend everywhere. <laughs> it also considers whether the body of students is truly international, meaning that students are from around the world, or are they primarily from a host country. In my mind, this doesn't matter as much. I am just as interested in teaching at a school that has only students that are like German or only students that are French, but a lot of people want to go to a school that really is international. It also considers whether a wide nationality is represented. So even if there's an international school, you might have just like Chinese students, and that's not really international. So it, it looks at sort of a wide nationality um, is represented. It kind of considers whether the school is well established. Most schools out there have a reputation. There's even like a website, which I will link below. You do have to pay for it, but it does rank schools based on the teacher's perspective. Just be careful with the ranking. Only two types of people go on there and write reviews. It's people that either hate the, hate the school or people that actually love the school. Uh, there's things to consider is if the international school is backed by an embassy. Schools that tend to be better seem to be backed by the embassy in that country and also even the United States or the UK or Australia. And, and that kind of means that there's a little bit money, more money to go around. This also considers whether the um, schools have high salaries depending on the area that they're in. So in, in Switzerland, you better be getting a lot of money. <laughs> and in Bulgaria, for example, you might get a high salary, but it's not high compared to the salary that you might get in Switzerland. It's a really good salary for where you live in, in Bulgaria, but not as a whole if you look at every single salary around the world. And also this master list looks over the turnover rate of um, teachers and whether they kind of move on. A good a good international school, I think, should have teachers that stay like around five years. And this is because you want a school where the teachers move on eventually and there's new ideas and new blood coming in and circulating, but they're there long enough to get kind of established and make a, their mark on the school. They're not hopping around and leaving after two years when their contract is up, but they're not staying forever and becoming sort of crotchety old people uh, who never change their ways and are stuck in their old beliefs. So you kind of want a school that's somewhere in the middle ground where the average is maybe around five years, in my opinion, okay? <laughs> in my opinion. Okay. This master list also sort of um, considers the schools that are well-rated by teachers at the um, this international review site. Again, I'll post a link for that international review site. It looks like it was made by Internet Explorer, <laughs> but it's pretty good. You do have to pay, I think, $25 a year, and it's worth it if you are looking at moving abroad. Don't do it if you're just thinking about it, but if you're actually like intending to do it, use that uh, as a good resource to sort of get you started at looking, looking at different schools. Okay, the bell's about to ring. So now I have hooked you and grabbed your interest into becoming an international teacher. And I want to go over just one last thing before we end this very quick video. And then again, reminder, I will do some future chapters. But let's start with sort of the challenges and benefits of being an international teacher. Like why in the Sam Hill Dickens would you go out and like leave your home country and go teach abroad. There are some really interesting things that kind of um, can challenge you or benefit you. The challenges. First of all, whether you are single or are living with a family or partner, you will have different sorts of challenges moving. As a single person, you are doing all of this alone by yourself. You may have the help of the school and the support of the school to help you move through that process, but it's still really effing scary. <laughs> to do this on your own and to figure out um, how to move and how to just like get yourself from A to B without 
panicking on a plane. I don't know. It can be really challenging. Like things like establishing a bank, getting public transportation, making sure you have an apartment. All of those things can be really difficult when you're on your own. Fortunately, those good schools that I told you about previously, those good schools have packages and PR people that will help you and they should help you get into the host country and get you there safe and sound and ready to go. All right, so if they're not doing that, you already know you're not in a good place. <laughs> Other challenges, you might face a new culture. And I think this can be kind of um, perhaps controversial but brave uh, when I say that, yeah, there are cultures that are different from your home culture, and they are different. Um, it could be something like uh, cities that pollute more or people that smoke more. Or they're fine with cussing wherever they go. I don't know. It, it, like... You will go into a place that's not like home and you need to be set up to experience that. I think particularly for Americans, we sort of have this bolster, uh, we're American, we can go into a room, be loud, aggressive, and we're the, the top of the world. And sometimes you have to sort of suck it up, shut up, and live with whether, whatever place that you've sort of moved into. And realize that maybe America isn't the top of the world, number one, and two, that you might be in a place where uh, being American isn't all that great and you need to sort of shut up about it. I have been in countries where I have sort of um, not advertised that I was American and um, it was maybe sort of dangerous for me as a young female woman to advertise that I was American and do that. So you have to sort of kind of I don't know, tamp down maybe where you come from as you move into a new place. And I think that can be sometimes challenging for people. Another sort of challenge when it comes to go to an international school is that it can kind of feel like the Wild West in the sense that there might not be as much regulation when it comes to the school. And if you come from a background of working at a public school where everything was like mandated, regulated, check, 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 checked, um, you might find that you will go to a school where you personally are only observed like once a year as a teacher from your administrators. Or you might find that it's an international school, but it's sort of given license to teach whatever the heck it wants. <laughs> so you might be angry because there's no like standards to teach. So you have to sort of figure out the curriculum yourself. Or if it's an IB school, it might be regulated by the IB, but you will certainly find that different IB schools do things differently. And there's definitely a higher quality to the IB education in some schools than other schools. Like, that's the truth. So there's no overarching, I don't know, government that's sort of like, you need to do this, you need to teach this this way and follow this plan. Instead, it can be kind of the Wild West. So if you're someone that really likes a planned, organized teaching curriculum where it's very clear what you need to do and how you need to do it and even when you need to do it, I don't know if international teaching is right for you. Uh, you might want to really like research the heck out of that school and see if it has that sort of curriculum, if that's what you enjoy. Another challenge that I think people just don't think of, they kind of get on the plane and they move abroad, is that once you're here and you've paid for whatever you need to pay for, and trust me, there are going to be some hidden things you have to pay for, you then have to sort of establish a livelihood. If you have a family, for example, it can be quite challenging uh, getting a job for your partner, unless they're another teacher, or um, getting schools for your children. Not every international school will take your kids, or if you have younger kids but you work at a secondary school, you might have to find a school for them as well. I know of a particular family where the school promised a job to the partner to be like the school doctor or school nurse, and then that sort of fell through. And once they're there landed, they had to figure out what he would do as a job to make money, to make ends meet. So I think it can be difficult if you do not already come prepared with some money uh, saved up because it's going to be kind of difficult in the beginning and you don't know what's going to happen. And if you don't know the language of the host country, it can be even harder to find a job for any partner or family member. Unless, of course, they're being hired as a teacher, which does happen. A lot of schools, a lot of the good schools will help also with this and they should help you with this and uh, maybe there can be some other jobs if your partner is not a teacher. Other things in terms of also establishing life is like, you know, getting the things like, um, I don't know, football soccer club for your kids or uh, getting ballet lessons. Those kinds of like life things that you have to sort of figure out and it 
can be kind of difficult. I know that for the first year it can really feel unsettling and not like home because you just don't have those like extra home routines set up in that first year. And it can take time. It can take time to really make that place, your new place, your new country feel like home. I think the biggest problem of moving abroad is the isolation and loneliness that you will feel. You will. You will miss home. I know you might not think so, <laughs> but you will miss home in some way. You'll miss your best friends back home. You'll be on different time zones. Uh, if there's a pandemic going on, you know, you really will worry about them and miss them. And that can be really difficult. I know if you're going alone, like I did, uh, there was times in that first semester where I just like came home, curled up into a little burrito and cried <laughs> because I was so lonely. You're not aware of how lonely you can get until you have been cut from the, the shelter and the bubble and the community that you're used to. Like I didn't realize how much I needed them or just like my home state and, and people that spoke my language until I truly cut all of that away and went to a country that I couldn't even read the letters and the alphabet. So that sense of loneliness can be really strong and um, it can be very hard. It can be very hard. Now, there, of course, international schools have a really strong community. With the international teachers, you might find that you will only have friends that are colleagues, but I think like for me, I always want to make friends outside of my school. Like what's the point of moving if I'm only talking to other people who speak English? So in the first year, first semester, I felt lonely and it was hard. And I think that, you know, you, you should consider that before moving abroad as well. And lastly, one of the weirdest challenges of um, international teaching, and it goes back to my previous point, is that there are just some strange people <laughs> that become international teachers. I myself am included in that list. There's something strange about us and weird. <laughs> and I, I have found some of the weirdest people out there internationally teaching. I guess I could probably say myself too. <laughs> some nomadic sensibility. There's something that's like deep in us that makes us really strange, that makes you have this desire that you want to like leave your home and become this like nomad person living inter internationally and i think the the longer that people become and are international teachers and they stay in that profession the weirder they become <laughs> but yeah there's some really weird people great interesting fascinating people but um yeah <laughs> I don't know, some weirdos. <laughs> some good weird and good bad, you know, bad weird. I don't know. But it can make for some really interesting stories. So let's talk about the good of becoming an international teacher. Well, first of all, you are going to have a life-changing experience for the better. You are going to grow. Your understanding of people is going to change. Your understanding of society is going to change. Your willingness to be flexible and adapt is also going to grow. You will become a better person internationally teaching. Even if you go to a school that might not be good, you will definitely grow and you'll experience something that very few people can do, which is to live in a foreign country, which is something that's quite incredible. If you teachers that you will become friends with, you will become really lifelong friends with them. I think there's just something where you go through a shared experience like this that will make very strong bonds with the people around you. So one of the best things about international teaching is that you get to travel. Like that's the whole point, right? So you get to see different things, new, have new adventures, see the world. Um, I've been to like Azerbaijan, I've been to uh, Romania, Greece, I've been to Turkey. I've seen edges of the world that most people haven't seen. I've seen things that most people only dream about in stories. Like, that's amazing. One of the other great things is the diversity of the teaching staff. I think that's such a highlight that maybe needs to be uh, more stressed. It, it's so exciting to work with people that are also from different countries. Like, I've had uh, a head of a department that was from Germany. I had a head of a department that's from uh, England. I have worked with people from New Zealand. I have worked with people that uh, were Bulgarian or Russian or Ukrainian. I have um, really gotten to know like different cultures 
and different teaching styles through, through my colleagues. And it wasn't just one voice or one perspective all the time. It was multiple voices, multiple perspectives. It really made meetings kind of interesting. <laughs> so I think that was sort of a highlight. And lastly, there are some monetary benefits to international teaching. There's packages that you should really consider. Some of those things include the stipend that you get or money that you get as a salary. It can be much better than public school teaching. Not always, but it can be. If you go teach in certain schools in China, or in the Middle East, you will make bank and save a lot of money. And there's other things like, uh, for example, some schools will fly you home once a year, or they will provide housing, or they will give you really great professional development. So there are some other things that you should think about when looking at international schools, which is really exciting and you should take full advantage of. My next video, I will try to cover a little bit more about like how to apply, when to apply, and what to look for in international schools. If you like this video, please sure to like, like, and subscribe. I will try to provide more information for you as we sort of delve into the semester. Ooh. <laughs>